Can I ask Janine to re lead us in a karaoke, please? Tato. Takataka to Hoki to Uru, Takataka to Hoki to Tonga, Kiana Kina Kina Kiuta, Kiana Tara Tarak, Yakiana to Kura, Tio, Ka, He Ohu, Tihe, Mori Ora. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody for our first um, Risk and Assurance Committee meeting of the new Triennium. Um, I have no apologies, and I think all committee members are here. Sorry, thank you. Um, confirmation of the agenda, um, if we can confirm that as it's been circulated. Thank you. I move seconded. All those in favour say aye. Against carry. Thank you. Um, do any committee members have any new disclosures of interest they um, would like to notify at this time? Yes. Uh, yes. So we um, are going to hear from KPMG. My daughter is employed by KPMG. She's in the Auckland office doing data and analytics, and has nothing to do with the team which we will be hearing from. So I don't think the conflict causes a problem. Uh, as a management process, I don't discuss anything in, in relation to the Waikato Regional Council with her. Thank you, Paul. I also think the committee should be aware that I have a son that works for Waikato Regional Council. Um, he's not a dependent. Um, and as I'm not a ratepayer, I don't believe this causes any issue, but I think it's important that I do declare it. Okay, moving on to um, matters arising. Janine. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. So um, just for completeness of bringing forward um, some matters that were raised in uh, the last committee meeting of the last triennium. Um, with most of those dealt with through today's agenda, um, just noting though in relation to the first point, the policy update, which is around Council's protected disclosures policy, um, that we do have some uh, exercising of that policy uh, planned. Uh, effectively a two-stage test. So the first one will be a, a notified test to work through, iron out any crinkles. Um, uh, and then the second one will be just an anonymous, um, un unnotified testing of those processes as well. Questions? And I have a mover and seconder that we receive that report, please. Thank you, Paul. Hughes. All those in favour say aye. Against carried. Thank you. Um, the next agenda item is the risk management activity report, but I thought, thought um, being the first meeting of the Trinam, um, I would invite the CEO to make any comments that he might like to at the present time. If I can um, just note, I think it's very important that the CEO does attend these meetings. Um, and I'm very pleased to see him here showing a commitment to um, risk and audit. Um, so Chris, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. and. Um, risk and assurance, of course, is uh, highly important for me as a chief executive, and it's uh, it's very useful for me to hear the discussion from a governance point of view about uh, about the matters on the agenda. Um, so, uh, in the past, I've sort of given what's on my mind, you know, sort of the the big things that that relate to risk, um, and and thank you, chair, for inviting me to do so again. 
So I, I guess it's no surprise that one of the big things right at the moment is, you know, what the impact of the weather events have been. You know, in our region, um, you know, I, I guess that people say we have dodged a, a bullet. I'm not sure that's quite the right term because we did get hit by a bullet, I think. But what we did was dodge a bomb that, that went off, you know, kind of around the corner in Tairapiti and, and Hawke's Bay. And, you know, we, we have... We have had some quite severe impacts in, in part of our region. From our council's perspective, I think that our assets have stood up pretty well. I think there's been some probably reasonably minor impacts on, on assets. But um, I do note that an assessment is, is still ongoing. There are there are impacts in catchments throughout the region. You know, it might be rivers, it might be catchment works, there's a lot of slips, there's been a lot of mass movement, and it's gonna there's a, a quite a lot of recovery work will have to be done in that respect and I guess that you know just a note of caution that that could well as we better understand what needs to be done and how quickly it might impact some of those uh, already planned uh, catchment programs. The When when we went to sort of pre-cyclone hail because there had been a lot of rain and storm surges pre then especially as it was hitting to Coromandel um, I guess coastal erosion was quite foremost on my mind uh, that's sort of almost as kind of got forgotten about as roads have got closed throughout the region and, and then the events that happened a bit further south in the country. Um, but, you know, I guess there's going to be a lot of learnings from these weather events, and some of that's going to be internally within our region, but I think the government's going to have a, a lot of inquiry about what's going on, especially, and it continues to go on in, uh, in the Gisborne region and in Hawke's Bay, and I've got no doubt that will impact us in some way. So what that is... Only time will tell. Um, I was particularly interested in some of the the monitoring systems, which you know, regional councils are responsible for, um, and and how some of those have succeeded through in in, in regions uh, in the recent events. But how in Hawke's Bay, clearly, you know, some went down very quickly, and I think that there's probably an item later today from KPMG, uh, you know, that risk assessment, that whole interconnectivity of infrastructure, you know, we, we rely on, on things working together for the whole system to work now. You can just take out one piece of the system, be it fibre optic, optic cable or be it um, power, and then it, it, it impacts a lot of other aspects of the system. So we'll probably need to think, what does that mean for us and our responsibilities in our region going forward? Um, something that's not talked about much is, is quite an impact of Gabrielle on forestry especially in the topo catchments and it wasn't to do with rain it was all to do with wind a lot of the rain had dropped in the in the hawks bay area and you know it's about four thousand hectares of forestry which has been snapped effectively a lot of it's uh maori land holding uh huge impact you know it's, I, I think um the chair and i have been talking with uh we uh talked with some of the iwi down there just recently you know it's 20, 25 percent of some of their forestry holdings have been impacted, which is, is really significant. I think the impact of access to parts of our region through road impacts has been well known. Um, one of the, the very good pieces of technical work that our staff did very early on, and this was pre-Gabrielle, was this, the saturation index of our, of our region um, and predicting what the impacts of that might be in terms of landslides and mass movements impacts on roading infrastructure and so on. And the advice that was, was given is was very, very good and very accurate and, and has turned out. So, and uh, I know that uh, even as high as the Prime Minister who's seen some of that information that was provided has, uh, has congratulated us on, on that. Um, the only other, or two other matters of interest relating to the cyclone, um, Greg has just come in the room, uh, mentioned to me yesterday that um, you know, at Paidoa, we talked about the success of, uh, of being able to close the bridge here, but actually some of the catchment effect of sediment coming down um, and actually down around that lower lower river area, uh, some of it's contaminated. You know, old tile mining tailings and you know, these sort of things that you don't uh, readily think about, um, you know, is, is something that we, we've got to think about. And, and, you know, we've had staff who have had enough technical knowledge to say, Gosh, before we get in there and handle it, let's just check what we're dealing with. Um, you know, again, uh, very fortunate that some of our staff have that technical knowledge. And the final thing I'd say related to it is um, a, a lot of this occurred when we were trying to encourage staff to take leave. 
uh, with lead balances, and there has been no respite, especially as they hit one after the other. And so we are very cognizant, and Greg's very cognizant that some of the staff are probably at the point where they yeah, we need to they need to do a lot of work in the recovery phase, but we need to look after their welfare and just check around fatigue as well. So look, I just sort of make some comments related to the weather events. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, Greg could answer them. The other things on my mind are probably a little bit more routine, you know, that the whole cost of living interest rate impact, the impact that had on our discussions around the annual plan, the impact that's going to have um, as, as we go forward and, and work through our long-term plan discussions, uh, we'd have to be very cognizant of. The reform programs that government's on, it's kind of interesting now, as we see with the new Prime Minister and the change in the and some of the policy direction that's being signalled with more to come. Um, I, I guess the key risk for us in this is that the government, the way they've been operating, is giving us pretty short timeframes on very major pieces of legislation. You now we got we got notice after five o'clock yesterday of an, a piece of emergency legislation going through the house to do with um, encouraging uh, recovery from the, the, the extreme weather events. Um, I kind of picked it up at half past eight last night. We had to make, we had, we were given till nine o'clock last night to, to tell them whether we would be making a submission. Submissions are going to, the select committee is going to hear submissions today and, and it will be go through parliament tomorrow. You know, that, that's extreme, but it's, you know, and it's been an extreme event. But even the, the natural built environment act reform things that, uh, that, you know, we've had to work with council through. Um, we've had fairly short timelines on major pieces of legislation over holiday periods, you know, to try and get uh, not only um, count staff across it to get a governance position on it and then being able to get it in a form that uh, we can submit on. And, you know, we've heard that the Climate Adaptation Act is going to be coming at us thick and fast, you know, to go through the House uh, by June. Um, key roles, uh, we've talked in the past about the turnover of staff. It, the turnover is still high. I've probably got less in this concern about the turnover per se. It's more there's key roles that, uh, you know, we need to, as people retire or leave for whatever reasons that we need to replace. I think we've been pretty successful um, the, and in, in doing it, but we do have to pay more than we'd previously planned on and um, Janine was just reminding me earlier that the, the lag times of being able to recruit people are, are increasing. Um, so that still sits there. Uh, and uh, our policy programs, which rely on considerable engagement uh, with our iwi partners in the community, um, having to meet uh, sort of timelines, continue to um, uh, take it, suck a lot of time and resources out of staff and councillors and, and those people we have to work with externally. Uh, that's probably the, the main things that were that I'd share. Thank okay. you, Chris. Um, if we just go back to the end of Janine, could um, take us through your yeah. report. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. And so I think Chris's commentary has probably covered off um, much of the content that's provided in the report around the um, current and emerging risks. Um, a number of those actually be, actually being um, issues rather than risks. Um, maybe just a, a couple of other comments in that space. Um, we know that uh, in terms of the response to the cyclones, obviously the national state of emergency has now ended. Uh, so that will revert back to a regional and local um, response to that. And I think there have been discussions through our Civil Defence Emergency Management Group just around that um, coordination of activity uh, with, you know, political leads being appointed for different communities um, based on need. Um, in terms of the cleanup, so, you know, a staff report noting, um, I think last week, 360 staff working 56,000 hours um, fixing Coromandel um, roading highways. So the extent of uh, damage is uh, significant and um, will be with us some time while that's resolved. Um, we note in paragraph 13 around um, property insurance, um, I had received some communication 
um, internally from a staff member where um, a property owner was asking us for information about the one in a thousand year flood risk to their property um, because they had been asked for that in information from their insurers. Um, we don't hold that level of um, flood risk information. We, you know, have one in a hundred is a fairly typical um, time frame, but we're starting already to see some of those conversations come through um, in terms of the markets. Um, and Chris has noted in terms of uh, our staffing levels, turnover, time to recruit um, and the legislative reform. So perhaps if I turn to page 12 of the report, which um, really starts stepping into um, our risk management framework and our key strategic risks. Um, and just to note, I guess, the way that the report um, is structured. So uh, I think those elected members who have been involved in risk workshops that we have had with KPMG um, as our internal uh, auditor will uh, be familiar with the construct of our top 10 strategic risks, which we need to review that they are right. Um, and also conversations around um, council's risk appetite. Uh, so the way that the report is structured is to provide you um, the risk summaries in terms of all top 10 risks and what might have changed uh, since we last reported. Um, but then to look down into those areas where we do a deep dive um, across, the, um, across the year, um, in terms of making sure that we've got the risk correctly stated um, and the associated controls um, noted as well. So four deep dives that are being reported um, to you for this meeting, which is around relationships, health and safety, fraud and climate change. Um, changes to those detailed risk summaries are all noted um, in red text, so you can see what's what's changed um, as a consequence of those um, discussions. The process that we run through for that, so Scott Thompson, who's our strategic risk advisor, is sitting in the back row over there. Um, Scott facilitates those deep dives with key staff across the organisation um, and key um, risk action owners. Um, to make sure that they are reflective of um, current thinking and current practice. Um, so those deep dives are there and we can we can step through those um, with any questions, comments or feedback that elected members may have. Uh, we note in the report um, that in terms of overall with the strategic risks, um, there are a number of them where um, our residual risk actually exceeds um, council's risk appetite. Uh, and so some of those will be appropriate in terms of how, how far, how much can council invest in terms of bringing those risks uh, down to within the appetite statement. Um, but there will be others where it is transitional in terms of an issue that's um, particularly live at the moment um, and that uh, risk may be trending down over time. Um, perhaps with that overview of the report, we'll just pause and take any feedback or questions from elected members. Any questions? Do you intend to carry on speaking to your report on questions on the whole lot? Uh, questions on the whole lot, okay. I think, in terms of... Um, without stepping through each of the deep dives, which is what's set out in the report. Um, I guess questions from elected members around the risk framework, um, what's presented uh, in that regard. Um, raise it now. Uh, David, just to move, just need to move, reuse your microphone. And, and yeah, I always feel as though I shout. Move it down. Pull your mic down. I always feel as though I shout, and so don't need these. Uh, people online unfortunately can't hear the room unless we. Oh, okay. Yeah. No point taken. Sorry. Um, 
when I looked through the changes and I reflected on the OAG's presentation um, a couple of weeks ago around integrity and look at some of the percentages that are in here around the existence of fraud and quite a lot of them were what pages particularly um, so this page 34 it, it's on the fraud it's on the fraud deep dive and so that's starting that's starting on page 34 um and when i look at some of the percentages um quite a lot of frauds are in middle management and executive quite a high percentage and yet when i look at a lot of the changes um there's almost an imbalance of focus on staff, staff trainings, staff this. And so where the major percentages of fraud seem to take place, didn't quite seem to align with some of the su suggested changes. Obviously, I wasn't involved with the background. I could, could quite happily be off the mark, but it was my observation when just reading through the, the, the changes. Um, okay. And and sorry, Janine. And I, I can only apologise to people who were not at the Auditor General's uh, presentation, where they were talking about uh, the integrity framework um, of about two weeks ago. I I think my response would be that fraud is always. Um, a system and it's very much um, toned from the top and being um, top management being held to account and, and you know this this body is part of that holding to account um, but the tone from the top as well as empowering and enabling and training and educating um, staff underneath in terms of um, the ability to speak up if they're uncomfortable with things that are happening um, you know, we've noted, or it notes in there, uh, links very much with the program of this committee around, um, you know, one of the key controls, the top control noted in terms of that job rotation, um, leave periods and, and the like. And that is something that this committee has had um, a, a very close eye on um, over a number of years, and we actually see embedded within the reporting here. So the ability for people to, um, or the need for people to step out of their role and for somebody else to substantially do that, um, that is a key control that we do have in place. And the people captured by that will be managers. Um, so all of our managers, people with key financial delegations and the like. So. You know, we are enacting some of those things through those processes as well. I was, uh, David, I was very comfortable with the changes because I felt that um, it's critical that staff are aware of their responsibility to be sceptical and their obligation to raise concerns when they see them. And I think very much the responses here would, um, be about as far as you can go and making sure or encouraging that to happen. So um, I was was comfortable with with the direction we're going in this. Okay, no, fine. Thanks, Chair. It was it mine's a cold read, right? So mine's I apologise. It was just that cold read. Yeah. Okay, no, I'm comfortable. Thank you. Yes. Uh, just on the question of fraud. So um, the you have all the procedures in the world, but what protects the organisation's culture? and engagement and it's the same health and safety same or quality so in terms of a fraud culture is any any comment or on that too general a question to give an answer um i'd probably prefer to answer it that in terms of trying to anti-fraud uh, culture trying to prevent it <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah i think that um it is something that we um we push pretty hard that uh we, we have very little that comes to our attention, but the systems seem to pick it up because, you know, I can think of maybe two or three matters in the last maybe two or three years uh, where it has been picked up uh, in, in one instance, or in, in all instances, I think those staff no longer work in this organisation, but it wasn't at the high end level of personal gain. It was, it was pretty low, it was pretty low level. Um, 
I, I like to think that the way we vet our recruitment, you know, we, we recruit staff and put, try and vet out people who wouldn't. I think that most people who come and work here are quite morally principled and, and good. But of course, that raises that you can't get, you can't rest on those laurels because that's where, you know, it could go undetected. I, I believe that we have systems in place and we do have messages from going from myself and through the executive um, periodically, a, a reminder about it. And it's you know, part of the, the manager's responsibilities to, to be looking out and, dete and detect it. I think that you know one of those learnings that came out of the Needham City Council a bunch of years ago was you've got to be, be very careful of those who don't take a lot of leave. Um, especially at the at the at the senior levels in the organisation, which I think is why this committee has a lot of interest in it, and, and keeps putting the pressure on, on myself and we to ensure that we keep staff taking leave at those senior levels. Yes, that's one of the reasons. The other is the obligation or well-being, and you can't just work endlessly. I have a question about the health and safety deep dive. Um, two questions, actually. On page 30, um, we have a low risk appetite and a medium after mitigation risk. I just wonder, does that result satisfy the legal obligations of the council to take all practical steps and secondly, um, Chris, maybe I could ask you to talk to what steps council is, or yes, council is taking to um, induct new councillors and committee members on their obligations under health, safety and welfare. Because this is one area that I'm seeing across the work that I do where I'm detecting an increasing laxness um, in what's being done, both at a operational level, but more concerningly for me, at a governance level. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'll, I'll respond to the second part of that question, um, which was to do with the governance training. So we do have, um, so last triennium, um, we had uh, Simpson Grierson coming in and giving uh, uh, training to, to governance and actually the, the executive and, and, and senior management in the organisation. And uh, so that, uh, that so that council, council laws could understand what their obligations are in the local government environment uh, with respect to health and safety. We have that planned. In fact, at this stage, we're hoping to do that after the uh, council meeting at the end of the month. Um, it's it's vitally important because of the uh, the way the legislation works is that it starts at the top. Um, there are some nuances which are different in local government to what is in the private sector, which is important to understand. Um, and so uh, we've had an, an intensive and extensive uh, induction program of councillors, and we are programming that in the near future. Thank you. You. Um, Janine, do you want to comment on the first part of the yeah, question? Thank you, Mr Chair. And I think that's a really good um, question that we should revisit in terms of that uh, residual risk rating. If we look at our Safe Plus audit, which is the last one that we've done, all of the actions coming out of that have been addressed. We know there's been significant work done around psychological risks. Um, and bow ties, bow tie analysis done on that. Um, there is nothing, I guess, that's coming to my mind in terms of an absence or a weakness within our health and safety system um, that would say, uh, you know, we are not taking all practicable uh, measures to address those those risks for our people. So. That suggests that this report is wrong yeah. and needs to yeah. be addressed. Yeah. Okay. Could so we we'll, we'll, take, we'll take that as an action um, yeah. to follow up um, and report back into the next committee. Um, and if if the risk ranking 
following that review is to stay at medium to be very clear on what actions might be required to reduce that down in line with the risk appetite statement. Thank you. Paul. Chair, this is a nuanced area. So if we look at the type of um, accidents you can have and the sort of consequences, then we have the um, proverbial trips and paper cups with lo um, cuts with low consequence, and the likelihood of them of them's high, the consequences low, and possibly a medium risk ranking is just kind of fine. Um, where we might have a different view is the high impact accidents that lead to very bad, which what you've got here is critical um, injuries, and the tolerance could be extremely low for that. I've seen organize and this might sound weird, but I've seen organizations actually do, do two rankings. Yes. And so for the high impact accidents, there's a very low, low tolerance. And that leads to some behaviors. That means that any near hit which has a high consequence, you know, has a high consequence near miss or near hit is investigated and there's a full report, even though there was no actual accident. And so it leads to a whole lot of behaviors. But the, it accepts the fact that the odd trip fall and paper cut does happen, and we kind of accept that risk to a higher level. So I don't know whether you want to build that in yeah, or not. Yeah. The sort of two tier, or is that just making the whole thing too complicated? I, I actually think it's a good idea. I think I've seen organisations separating um, outside staff from office staff, and I think you're right. Quite different risks. Maybe we need to do that to get a level of granularity that is meaningful. I, I think that's useful in terms of um, at one end of the scale, you're always at the um, catastrophic impact and, and, you know, so that needs to be managed very differently to um, the lesser events which would um, calibrate those. There's also a challenge in that people put together structures and the structure has to be followed and you multiply A by B and you get yeah. C. Yeah. And C can never be low because B is high. Um, that's a Which is prob of a, probably a coming, here. coming through in here. So, But I think to understand, um, are there further actions that we could reasonably take to mitigate um, or to bring down that residual risk um, isn't coming through in this, this deep dive. Councillor um, Hughes. Thanks, Mr Chair. I guess just... Uh, comfort for from a new councillor. Um, as part of our in, uh, initial indoctrination process, we were introduced to a pair, um, two of the team leaders from the health and safety people, and they certainly gave, I thought, an excellent overview of the risks and um, responsibilities that uh, councillors face in terms of health and health and safety. Um, so much so that I went home a little bit more frightened about risks than I was before I came, but that they did cover it off. In fact, that we're personally not liable, but they certainly gave an excellent overview and um, uh, gave us all a good, well, I felt a very good understanding of, our, of the risks for the council. And on the other side of the fence, I'm getting kickback from people that I talked to out in the, in the, in the I guess, in the rural community about how anal the council is in relation to enforcement of, of um, health and safety rules in the field. So it, it's put and, and it's pretty evident that um, what we hear this council table and what's happening out there are matched. Chris. Uh, thank you. And I just thought um, an additional comment, just a reminder to the committee and those councillors who are on the committee know this, but for the independents, that we do report at every council meeting on health and safety and uh, on on learnings from WorkSafe. In, in legislation um, on uh, matters that are of high importance, the, the review of our, our risks and any incidents and near misses that have occurred and, and what what any changes to our controls that might take place. But just a reminder. Thank you. Councillor Nick. Thanks, um, Graham. Uh, I want to back as well the idea of that split because even um, my previous experience is that often just ends up in a lot of discussion trying to get that medium so I think clarity would be a safety side. Um, 
as chair of climate action, you know, I take a huge interest in that deep drive. Um, I did think reading it that perhaps it isn't the latest, most up to date um, piece because um, a lot of it looks like it's um, still some older information. Uh, so uh, that's me reading it, um, but happy to hear what you think. Um, but I am mindful that for the others in the committee, a lot of it is still very much relevant. Um, we have uh, reinstated the committee and it has a work program that's been continued and the trajectory looks, um, well, from, from the previous meeting we just had, um, people are quite comfortable with, with the direction so far. Uh, there are some new changes that have come in, like um, more focus on the um, financial disclosures for climate, uh, which is mentioned in there, thank you. Um, but one thing I noticed by really giving it that critical eye is there are still a few other drivers that are in there of, of how we might not achieve and some more controls that could come in. And the main one that I just think was worth talking about uh, or raising is that there are a whole lot of little uh, bitsy things going on in regard in regards to our collaboration with others, especially the other territorial authorities, and uh, so things, or, or even others in the community. So say the Waikato plan, and we don't know what the future of that is just yet. That'll be updated in some stage. Um, the wellbeing project, UNISA, and the CoLab energy work group and so forth. I think it might be time for us to consolidate that and, and do it better to provide to deliver on that intention of providing strategic leadership for the region. So I just thought I'd flag that um, that it'd be good to um, look at how we do that better and I'll take that on board with the Climate Action Committee to perhaps have that come through their uh, next meeting in May. But then we could update further and it'll be most up to date for everyone. Thank you. Any other questions? if you like. Uh, so health and safety, Chris, um, sometimes the test comes when there's a crisis and people and we send people out into the worst weather. To, so did we have a clean run on health and safety through the storms? Um, I'll just ask uh, Greg to respond to that. Um, so Greg Ryan, Integrated Catchment Management Director. Um, so just to cast my mind back, it's been certainly quite a long journey. I think the, the primary health and safety matter that we've had to deal with is actually staff wellbeing um, over that period. Um, some of our areas, notably the Coromandel, have been in, in some um, sort of flood mode since before Christmas. And so what we've had to do is work really, really hard to make sure that um, there is some good rostering in place to make sure that our staff are taking breaks. Um, we have had to have, have one or two firm conversations around that just to ensure it does happen. Um, so that would be the primary um, health and safety matter that has arisen. Um, we had a really good example of positive health and safety outcomes with the operation of the Criterion Gate at Paidoa. Um, previously that has involved a huge amount of um, physical labour um, and time to get that gate in place, whereas now the new gate is in place um, from 2018. It's a much more straightforward process, much more quicker, and we don't have staff exposed to those significant risks um, that they would have been otherwise. So that was a really positive outcome. Um, we did have um, or one one. We've had a couple of um, health and safety risks that we really need to highlight um, to our teams. Um, one is around the fact that we've got a lot of standing water out in the catchments, um, and it's hot weather, of course, so you get water quality issues that occur. So just making sure that we're really conscious um, of of our controls that are in place to manage that particular risk and ma making sure that staff are aware of it. Um, Travel around the region as well, we've had to be really conscious of that. Obviously our roads, um, particularly the Coromandel, but also other parts of the region are increasingly fragile. So making sure that we are managing that star, uh, that travel appropriately, that staff are, are being aware um, of those um, differing roading conditions out there. Um, and the last one, I guess, is around um, the interactions, I guess, that we have with our community um, and just being aware that, you know, we do have community under pressure out there. There's lots of all sorts of different community pressures impacting people, impacting their own personal wellness and well-being, um, and just making sure that staff are cognizant of that. Um, 
been going in tra- interactions. I know our staff are really good um, at that. Uh, many of them are part part of that community as well. So, Greg, I think there might have been one incident that we're just looking at to see if it's related, and that might have been to do with any flood water was contaminated that staff were having to work amongst, but we haven't mm. determined if that was directly related to the event or not. Yeah, yeah, we, we had a situation where one of our um, environmental compliance staff picked up a gastro bug um, following some work out in can, contaminated water. Um, the, um, there's two things that came about from that. One is that it was actually inconclusive whether there was anything to do um, with that particular water quality issue, um, particularly because the gastro bug affected the wider family um, that wasn't working in the flood um, situation. Um, but I guess, as I said, what it did do is just highlight that there is a fairly unusual situation um, out there um, with a lot of standing water around and just making sure that we're being clear around what controls um, need, we need to put in place um, to manage that and making sure there is that awareness of staff. But yeah, there's, there's, it's certainly, um, it was inconclusive about whether, in, whether there was any direct connection there, but a good outcome regardless. Um, so getting onto the climate change risk, uh, by the way, these excellent deep lives, thank you. Um, I guess there's two. There's a, a micro question and a big picture question. But the micro question is that if you look at Hawke's Bay, the uh, flow technology and um, monitoring the Esk River got washed away after five seconds and the council wasn't getting any, the regional council wasn't getting information, didn't do anything actually. I can see there was, um, they had a major flood in 18, they thought it was a one in a hundred year and didn't put in a text system, which they talked about because they thought it'd be too expensive and too complicated. So the people in Escalade didn't have warnings um, and that there were fatalities. So that council is going to be having a discussion at some point about that. So, and we're aware that a lot of telco com, uh, gear went down. Uh, so I'm on the board of Well Networks. Our job, and we had lots of outages, as you will be aware, people live here. Um, but our job is always to follow the directions of civil defence. Civil defence may not be encouraging them to sort of repower systems. So it's um, being able to work without our without our fibre networks and even without power. Is this is this something that we kind of have in the contingency plan? Um, that's sort of one. And the other question is, I guess one in a hundred, maybe one in not a hundred anymore. <laughs> yeah, a whole flood network needs to be considered, but. If I could respond, Mr. Chair, uh, to that. Um, absolutely, and that's what I, my, my initial comments were. You know, there's going to be learnings from these events and what's happened in Brisbane and the Hawke's Bay. In particular, probably the interrelatedness of all the how things work these days. Um, our, our Chair, Pamela Story, did ask us about uh, whether our vehicles have some way of communicating when cell phone towers go down and whatever. And so encouragingly for a lot of our emergency response type of functions, we still have RT uh, in vehicles. Um, but I think that uh, we, we, we are going to be a huge amount of learnings from this. Um, I think it's probably just not the, the washed out of the infrastructure and where that was located, but also the fact the dependency on power for some of those telemetry systems to work. And I, and I, Tracy Pugh and a lot of her teams are probably reviewing uh, how else have stood up uh, and, and what we're putting in place. Um, I, I, I think it was in the report, I know there's, there's also earthquakes that were occurring around the time, and so <laughs> we, we had to check, you know, that things stood up to earthquakes as well as the, the weather events uh, themselves, and of course these can always coincide, as we've learnt in, in the past as well. But Greg, you'd probably be able to comment on other aspects of the response system. Yeah, yeah, and there's a couple of points I'd note. Um, so we, we have a, um, a coordinated um, team that comes together during events, both in the lead up to and during events. Um, so it gets, it gets the right people around the table, uh, as far as our flood operations, um, our regional hazards folk, um, and also our environmental monitoring folk who run our hydrological network. Um, and that's really important so that we do have any, um, any foreshadowing of any issues that might be out there. Um, the second point I'd make, I think, is this, there's very good awareness um, amongst our teams about where our critical sites are, um, particularly where there's flood management decisions that may, meet, may need to be made, um, in, I guess, in the heat of the moment. Um, and so um, we do have processes in place where staff get deployed um, to those sites to keep an eye on them as well. I mean, we've been running these sites for, um, well, you know, since the Hodaki catchment, Waikato Valley Authority days. So, um, so there is a lot of those, I guess, initial processes that are in place, that initial knowledge so that we can make sure that um, we do have eyes on the ground at those right places to, uh, I guess, make sure those decisions can be taken at the right time. 
make decisions on the spot. We can work equipment sort of manually out, out on the field. We don't have to rely on all the, the technology if it falls over. Uh, so in terms, I mean, um, the Pyro Gates be one of the few um, examples where we have a, um, I guess, an operation that needs to be undertaken um, in terms of closing those gates. We do have gates in the Lower Waikato scheme as well, but there are redundancies there, um, right down to winding a handle um, to get them down. So um, that didn't come into play this time around, um, but there are redundancies in place in that regard. And if I could just add that um, in terms of communication, we will look at the satellite phone technology, and uh, I think Janine was telling me that we do have some Starlink capability. But I, I think that one of the learnings of all of this, which will come through, is checking what do we have, because communication is key at the end of the day. My understanding is that there's already, uh, last week maybe, there was a group of staff from across the organisation starting to get together and go, what are the different scenarios? Um, communication, but data movement as well. So what, what does that look like? What can we learn? What have we got? What do we need? But John Crane, who will be in later, might be able to provide some more insight into that. I know he was involved in those discussions. I just ask, um, as more and more of these learning, <coughs> excuse me, learnings come through from these weather events, that they be fed back to this committee? Because um, I think there will be quite a lot. Um. Uh, through you, Mr Chair, so um, we're currently um, running a debriefing process, um, both locally and regionally across our teams, um, and so we'll be summarising those key points. So I'm actually receiving a, um, having a discussion around my leadership team table today around some of the key learnings, and we'll certainly be able to gather a summary uh, there across our people, our systems, our processes. So I, I think it's so our, our learnings, but also in terms of in our nationally, nas yeah, the national, um, because they, yeah. So I expect there'll be a bit of a, a theme running across a number of meetings where we can bring any learnings or insights that we are becoming aware of, as well as others that will be of interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one more question for Chris. Um, could you just um, reiterate, I think you mentioned it the other day, and I know it's, it's in here in paragraph 16, a request from the regional sector to central government about investment in flood protection infrastructure. My specific question was actually, if you could just reiterate where, where that was at, um, because my understanding is um, the intention there is to request some support with um, upgrading infrastructure before cyclones hit as opposed to having to deal with the costs later after they've hit and there's no is that correct or um you know if if that kind of request was made then do we have quite clear information that say if central government said yes that we know exactly would be ready shovel ready to put forward what we would want to have invested Um, you have a question. Oh, sorry, I'll just respond to the, the, um, to the request. Um, Greg is actually intimately involved in that. Um, and as I said the other day, there is, as part of the regional um, sector's approach to government, which was made in the last couple of years, uh, but they haven't done anything with, we've, we're going to go again with a $250 million package, I think it is, plus, uh, of which we're We'll be requesting that $43 million. It's for existing existing works, but to be able to ensure that they um, uh, can be done in a timely fashion. Um, Greg, you, you, you might like to talk to it, but to ensure that they get up to our levels of service uh, as quickly as we can. Yeah, so so this was a, a national request that was made across the country, um, and there were some quite specific parameters that we agreed nationally as well in terms of what we put forward. Um, one of them was that the projects are already in our long-term planning, uh, so this isn't about creating new projects necessarily. It's about um, assisting council to implement their, their existing programs. Um, we know we're having seeing a lot of cost pressures on our particular infrastructure program, um, but we've also put forward some river and catchment work as well um, because it is about taking a whole of catchment approach um, in terms of managing flood risk. Um, and we felt there is an opportunity there um, to, uh, I guess, a, a broader perspective. Um, there is a quite a detailed document that has been prepared um, to accompany that funding request for Budget 23. Um, 
which actually outlines that it's not just about infrastructure, it's about looking about the, uh, looking at the full range of um, controls that we have in place to manage flood risk, right, right through from land use planning up to emergency management. Um, this is, a, I guess, an interim step. Our ultimate goal is to have a consistent, um, the, the consistent involvement of central government in supporting our, our infrastructure investment and flood risk management. Um, but this is an interim step um, that we're looking at for um, over the next three years um, to continue to get that support while we continue to build that case for more sustained uh, operation from the government. Councillor Cookson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just while you're on health and safety, because I'm the chair of ICM, I just want to make it that you should be aware that you should be applying that health and safety over our, our contracting staff as well, that they're the ones that are most probably just as much or even more danger than our own staff in these emergency times. And um, whatever backup system that you're going to use, those contractors should be using the same systems. So you, our staff can keep them safe as well. It's no use a whole lot of different safety systems in place and and neither one is overlapping the other. So that's I just wanted because that did happen during those flood events. Um, there was an incident like that, that there is machines working out in the dark between tides and something happened and they should all be aligned is all I'm meaning. Yeah, so I just want you to be aware of that when you're making decisions. Thank you. I would just like to draw the committee's attention to the comply with uh, legislation survey results on page 45 and subsequent and point out this is a regular report that comes through to this committee. Um, make sure we don't forget about it. Any questions about that particularly? No. Right. Um, so I have a mover and seconder to receive this report. Thank you, a seconder. Thank you. All those in favour say aye. Against carried. Thank you. Item number seven, internal audit activity. Um, Scott, is he going to present this or are you? Um, Scott, do, are you speaking to this or do you want me to? Okay, cool. All oh, good. Um, so uh, this is just uh, the update in terms of our internal audit activity update. Um, probably just some key points to highlight from this. So I guess building on from um, the Chair's comment in the previous report around our legislative compliance processes, um, we have been, um, there was an internal audit that was undertaken last year by KPMG, and we've got David Sutton from KPMG online. Morning, David. Yoda. Um, which uh, had a recommended program of work or activities to undertake. Um, one of those was to uh, identify the top 10 legislations or pieces of legislation that um, impacted or had the potential to impact um, Council's operations um, most significantly. Um, Scott's been working through that uh, discussion with senior leadership teams across the organisation, um, and we had a discussion on that at the executive leadership team um, last week. Uh, I think from the ELT conversations, probably the the point that was raised was the not noticeable absence of the Resource Management Act within that list of legislation. Um, but particularly given the breadth and scope of the RMA um, in relation to Council's responsibilities as a consent holder ourselves and, and the need to comply in there. Um, so we will go away and do some further work um, on this. Um, I think where the discussion was landing was our need to understand, um, much like our overall risk management approach, what's our raw risk around this legislation? What controls do we have in place um, to manage those key risks? And then what's the residual um, risk to us as an organisation um, in terms of compliance with those acts? Um, then we can check in around the reliance in terms of those um, compliance controls and the like to make sure that they are being effective and managing 
um, the legislative risk, which will link in very nicely with our um, comply with surveying as well. Um, the report presents the um, review that's been completed in terms of future of working um, with the draft report provided there, um, and David can cover that off, as well as the scope in terms of a review that will be commencing around business continuity and emergency management. Um, we also note uh, the uh, other reviews that are currently planned or signalled through the internal audit programme with some delays or deferrals in terms of um, those work programmes just either in, um, around things like project management framework, we're very much in the middle of a refresh of that, so let's do the review once that's been uh, had a chance to embed in the organisation a little bit more. Um, and the asset management review, obviously, with a lot of work um, around that team at the moment um, in response to um, weather events, um, applying more pressure from an internal audit review um, was not considered uh, appropriate at this point in time. Um, that's probably a high-level overview from me. Um, what David there I'm um, I guess in terms of the internal audit report and uh, program status overall, um, and any questions from elected members. Thank you, Janine. David, do you want to speak to your various reports at all? Yes. Oh, look, I think it would be good to, to particularly touch on the flexible working uh, report, which, which is still in draft, so management haven't come back with responses to those findings, but I think it still makes for interesting reading and, and I should have said good morning, everybody. Um, so look, I think, I think uh, you know, hopefully you've had a read through that report. Um, flexible working is certainly an area that continues to to evolve, but we, we do know it's likely to be here to stay. Um, and even where it, it may create challenges for organisations, uh, we also know that it is one of the top things that employees are looking for um, in terms of a value proposition uh, for organisations that they choose to work for. And, and I guess if we're, man you know, in the last risk session, we talked about uh, some of the challenges around attracting and retaining staff. This this is a key plank to that. But the, the paradox is how do we manage culture um, and other engagement of staff uh, around that that model. So I think it was a really interesting review to, to be done. I think Waikato Regional Council has been very proactive in this space um, as compared to a number of organisations who have possibly slept walked through through this process, uh, particularly COVID, is, which accelerated movement to flexible working uh, models. Uh, we, we identified a number of strengths and, you know, I compare that to um, our own journey in KPMG. You know, there's been a strong investment, proactive investment by uh, Waikato Regional Council to support digital capability, which is a key, um, you know, being able to work flexibly without that is is, is, uh, is impossible. So I think that is a good step. Um, one of the key risks around flexible working offside is, is obviously around cyber and technology. There has been a looks like a strong emphasis on that. Uh, we didn't audit that component, uh, but uh, all of our discussions uh, indicated that was a strong area of focus by council. Uh, and you know, I think it was values based. So rather than being too rules based, which uh, I guess would have moved from uh, previously where people wanted to have flexible working arrangements, they had to go through a whole range of approvals and and, and changes, etc. Uh, it appears to be more trust based. Uh, so, you know, um, empowering uh, employees to work through the, the arrangement as well. Um, and if uh, they're seeing that trust in them, uh, then that uh, fosters good engagement overall. I think there were uh, a few only low findings that we identified, but but just to summarise those, uh, there were areas where there needed to be more alignment between um, policy and, and current practice. Uh, and also just ensuring that policies and guidelines did align, so just a few tweaks there to make sure that that's in place. 
uh, aspects around health and safety, just ensuring that we are thinking about the risks that apply to uh, people working from home and, and what is what is our approach going to be to uh, monitor and oversee those with a uh, consideration that it is part of our PCBU. So what is our approach to that? Uh, key, key component around training. So, you know, for managers, the, the biggest risk around this and the biggest talking point is, is leading of culture and um, dissolution of culture. It's only a, a key focus for us at KPMG as well. Um, try and giving managers more support around how to make an effective hybrid working environment, which may include, you know, more proactive check, uh, short and sharp, uh, short and sweet uh, check-ins with staff. Um, and, um, you know, also being clear around where it's not going well, when does that become a performance issue that should be managed similar to any other performance issue? So some more support um, and perhaps some more clarity around where working from home isn't going to work. You know, there are roles that are difficult uh, in council to support a, a working from home model that's not always clear. Um, so having some more guidance on when it's not really going to going to work and, and where it will have an impact on performance, which which isn't going to work for council. But potentially being open to um, having a process for appeals for staff to challenge that position. Uh, so just some refinements, I think, but but uh, from our point of view, um, the council had been proactive, is working through it as as many other organisations, but further forward than, than others that, that we've seen. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Nickel. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for that. And um, really, I really enjoyed reading this um, draft report. Um, it was really interesting and really um, wanted to back the messages that came through in there about consistency. Um, just from little things I heard here and there, I think that's um, on the money. Uh, and there were two points that came to mind. One was in the Key market trends you talk about um, flexibility is increasing productivity and um, being part of the employee value proposition. Something I've brought up a few times in the previous training is that um, concept of the four day working week, which can obviously have various forms. Uh, and since since then, there've been so many more studies come out and there's a massive um, bit of research that's just come out from the UK about a whole lot of companies trialing it. And, and again, is backing the increased productivity and the increased employee value proposition. So I thought it might have been mentioned in there, um, or uh, perhaps just interested if that's something we're looking at um, for the future potentially. And my other comment was, I have noticed that with our move to this building and obviously the changes to more flexible working, that one of the consequences has been that the building is a bit emptier than it would have been had it not been from the way that it was scoped pre-COVID. Um, and so that is another consequence um, that I would have thought I might have just seen mentioned somewhere, not in great detail, just um, that that is also something to be considered for workplaces, which I, I know we do because um, it came up in um, previous committee as well. So I just thought I'd add those comments and yeah, if there are any comments back, that's fine. I think um, if I could just comment on the four day week, yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting observation. We haven't seen uh, too much uptake yet in the New Zealand market, but I think it, it would be something for the council to consider, particularly if it's part of its uh, value proposition for getting uh, skills in the right place. But there are a lot of implications. So I think a lot of people are, are watching and waiting. Um, to see and perhaps to see um, if there is more wide scale up, up lift, but it should be something that is kept on the radar. Absolutely. Chris, yeah, yeah thank, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Nicol. Um, our executive team have been looking at this. In fact, there's a bigger discussion, and David, you might be able to comment on it around what is the future of work. It's, it's really interesting with the artificial intelligence sort of uh, directions mm. at the moment and what that might mean for us around the corner. Um, but just a couple of comments on on the four day working week. Um, you, you, you know, this whole consistency thing starts to bite pretty quick because we've got some roles which you, it would not be possible with a, a four day working week. We'd have to find other ways of being able to um, uh, provide you know, some of the field work operations, uh, which often require a more continuous presence and just can't compress it. Um, 
and uh, and and it, we we feel with our flexible working arrangements, we do offer quite a lot of flexibility for how the hours of, of work and how we work. Um, in terms of the occupancy of the building, it has started to um, it has been gradually increasing, and and we're part of our BI uh, is trying to get the accurate numbers of what days, how many staff are in our different premises, because it's not just uh, this building, of course. But it was it was built with a with a view that there'd only be a seventy percent occupancy at some future maximum employment rate because it was future proofed as well, and uh, and and that was seventy percent. And our feeling is, and at peak times, or well, my gut is that we're probably sitting around about the sixty percent uh, mark. So we're 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 kind of there, David. I don't know if you've got any other uh, comments around future of work itself, because the whole Workspace is rapidly changing. You know, an, an idea one day seems to get superseded by something else the next. Yeah, I I, I couldn't agree more. And and I think the you, you know the tension. I mean, we've seen the US taking quite a hard stance around uh, working from home, which which is perhaps moving back the other way. I think we do need to keep a really close watch on on developments to keep up with employee expectations uh, in this space. You, you mentioned about. Um, you know the potential disruption of of AI, AI or, or opportunities. So, I think the only thing we can be sure of is that it's going to continue to change, um, and we need to keep uh, making sure that our managers are up to speed with those trends and and ready to support employees as to how we evolve the organisation. Yeah, uh, there's quite a few American companies walk this one right back, haven't they? Um, and quite spectacularly. So, so two of the, the the challenges is one is if we've got people working remotely or four day weeks, is we've got to be clever and how or or competent and clever in how we manage performance and output. So I've heard the guy from the insurance company rave about his four day week, but he had a lot of good measures. He knew and he had a business that just process stuff. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what he did for a living was process stuff. And he could he could measure how much stuff his people were processing, and the whole team had to do their workload, or they couldn't go home the, the, the fifth day. But getting the the metrics and the competence of leaders and managers to manage the actual detail, and it's something where New Zealand we've often struggled at being being. So that's something I guess it's in the training that you've been talking about. And the second thing is if we get new starters who are not experienced, then we have to teach them and teaching them over the other end of a line. And I've seen this happen. It doesn't always work that well. So there's a challenge there how we build competence in, because, you know, if we can build an organisation from school leaders up, we're building a strong organisation. We're helping our community, we're doing all sorts of really good things. But doing it over the um, over Zoom meeting can have its challenges. And, of course, the risk is, um, you know, once you adopt that model, it is very hard to pull it back. Um, and I think I think with Perpetual, uh, who 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 led that um, that initiative, uh, as you say, they had good, they had good measures in place. There could be options for piloting it, but um, you you'd need to be careful around setting up expectations that the council would be moving to that in a full way without working through some of that that detail. Um, because yeah, once you move into that that position, it's it's quite difficult to unpick it and move back if it if it's not um, particularly working through. Thank that. Thank you for the feedback. Um, and um, I do get the sense that um, the council's really staying at the leading edge of thinking about these things, including with this report and working with you, David. Thank you very much. And mindful that, you know, future for local government change is another thing. There's so much up in there. Your story. Thanks for that, um, Mr. Chair. Um, I I don't want to belabor the point because obviously uh, others have brought up uh, a number of the, what I see to be the critical issues around the, the hybrid workforce. But I suppose alongside what, what you're talking about, Paul, in terms of managers being able to, to manage performance and having the appropriate measures in place, I suppose I also am picking up on on your comment in the report around um, 
uh, what may have developed organically around the water cooler now needs to be consciously created and strengthened. And, and so I suppose alongside building those, that ability to manage performance, it's that how, how do we ensure that our managers have the, the tools and the capabilities to build that, that culture in their team, particularly with new, uh, with new staff? How, how do we ensure that, that those who are naturally extroverts and, and then are working from home in an office feel that sense of engagement, that, that sense of value in this uh, organization and, and being a part of something that is bigger than, them, than themselves. Let's make sure that we're, we're also supporting our management team to have those skills and those um, alongside as well. And, and also would love a four day week. Don't know what we would do when government asked for feedback by 9 p.m. <laughs> Peace. Council Strange. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, probably just to add um, to the occupancy rates um, within our building along the lines of um, reforms, um, just bearing in mind with three waters that TA staff involved with the water side of things, you know, possibly could be located elsewhere. Um, and then um, reforms around unitary authorities that have been floated, um, be some co-location of staff um, from our TAs as well. Um, and also within the transport space, we did um, our business improvement review through PT. We did look at the co-location of staff as well. So um, yeah, just those things to keep on our radar as well. Councillor Cookson. Yeah, um, we just discussed earlier about resilience in our business. And I'm just worried that if you go down this line too quickly, you're going to forget about field staff that are not going to be able to fit in that system. And then you're going to have a two-tiered system that's not going to look good. So I seriously consider that you take this slowly and carefully because you don't want to be ha having a hierarchy in the system that no one else can achieve. Thank you. I have a question for management. With um, flexible working, having a different footprint every day, how do they, how do you ensure that the an appropriate control environment is maintained every day? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think some of that actually comes down to culture as well, um, which obviously we're talking about different um, cultural elements um, within uh, a hybrid flexible working environment. Um, when we, from a, a, a finance um, perspective, I guess coming out of um, the COVID uh, situation, we did have um, an internal audit review done around control effectiveness through that um, position. Uh, through that period, we would have to pivot very quickly um, to different ways of working. Um, and though that control environment um, is intact and, and operating still today, um, but I guess more broadly, uh, that's an interesting question and it might be an opportunity for, again, another um, review um, as we transition through, uh, you know, working out what flexible hybrid looks like, um, what are the considerations from an overall control environment um, that we need to make? Um, you know, I guess we've got our audit processes, which will give us some level of assurance as well. Um, but... I think when the operating environment changes so substantially, um, making sure that those um, belts and braces are still um, in place and working as intended is, will be important. And secondly, <clears throat> excuse me, our health and safety legis legislation was modelled on Australia. How are we, given the lack of too much uh, litigation over health and safety. What are we doing to monitor that we are taking appropriate steps in response to this um, changing uh, pattern of working from home to make sure our policies are fit for purpose? In terms of the work from home environment, yeah. So. 
um, part of the process um, under current practice uh, where staff are wanting to be working from home, they need to provide evidence of their working from home situation. Um, and that is actually reviewed by the health and safety team to make sure that it's appropriate. Um, we also obviously have um, the notification process um, in terms of um, any health and safety issues or concerns that are being flagged up, which would be discomfort, pain, those types of things, which may um, indicate that we need to do further investigation or further support around those people to make sure that their environment is appropriate. Dylan. Is there intended to be any testing of that or entirely rely on staff honestly? Um, Stu's sitting in the background and nodding, so we'll take that as a as a yes. Yeah. It, it was a, a recommendation in our report just, just to go over that whole area again and just, just make sure that we've been consistent. So I think I think perhaps when the uh, responses come to those recommendations, uh, Graham. It will make that position clear. Thanks. Any other questions? Don't. Um, can we have a mover and seconder to receive the internal audit activity update? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All the, those in favour say aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Good report. Um, Item eight. All right, MRE. So Greg. Greg. Morena Tato. Happy for me to get started, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Yeah. So um yeah, so this is an item um covering off um one aspect of our shovel ready program, which is basically an auditing requirement um which is triggered by the size of funding that we've received from MFE. Um, I would like to introduce two of my team, which are up on the, who are up on the screen, both based in Pitianga, both in the same office, quite potentially. Um, so Julie Bofel is our Shovel Ready Program Manager, and Emily O'Donnell is our manager, Hodaki Coromandel, and also looking after several, several Shovel Ready projects um, in that area. So they are both here to um, help with any detailed questions that the committee might, ha might have. Um, as I said, this this uh, paper is around auditing requirements that MFE have for two projects, um, Piaka Green Corridor and Upper Waimu Habitat Enhancement Plans. Um, and you can see in paragraph four of the paper the, the funding um, that we've received from MFE in regards to um, both those projects. Um, I, th I believe this is the second audit that's been um, undertaken. Um, and look, I guess in, in general, it's shown a clean bill of health um, in terms of the expectations from MFE on us, um, which is a a really positive reflection on the way that council has geared up um, to manage the shovel ready program, particularly in the way that we manage our program and projects um, to ensure there is visibility around expenditure and things being achieved. Um, I do note there was a, a internal process improvement that was identified through the audit process around conflicts of interest. Um, and that really for me just highlights the value, the value of undertaking this um, in terms of continuous improvement for the work that we do. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to leave it there. A um, really straightforward mm -hmm. paper, um, but three of us are here to accept any questions. Thank you. Questions? None. <laughs> Thank you for the report. Um, do we have a mover and seconder then for the that we received? Thank you, Councillor Hughes. Oh. Thank you. All those in favour say aye. Thanks, Kerry. Thank you. So we move on to the key projects activity update. On page um, 81. Janine, is this you again? Uh, yes, so I think we've got uh, three projects or programs covered through this report. So Greg will cover off Shovel Ready, um, I will cover off uh, Project Reboot, and we've got Tracy there in terms of the policy program as well. So, okay. Who's going to lead off? Uh, so I think Shovel Ready is the first one. Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, um, and, and as before, I'm joined by Julie Bofel, our Shovel Ready Program Manager. 
Um, uh, a note up front, um, I have actually picked up that there was an error in the agenda. Um, so you will note that in the agenda itself, the August report um, for the shovel ready program is included. Um, we are, of course, in February. Um, and so my apologies for that. Um, what I'll do is I'll work with you, Mr Chairman, to distribute the updated report um, for the visibility of members. Um, so I'll address that after this meeting. Um, but I will cover off um, some matters. So the whole um, report was wrong. It wasn't just a typo on the date. Correct. Oh. Yeah. I only just picked that up, unfortunately, Mr Chairman, so I do need to understand how that occurred. Yes, we'll circulate that after this meeting. Yes, yes, and I'm happy to receive any questions um, from members following the circulation of that updated report. Um, um, so. That's for reading. Just, just for clarity, though, um, Mr. Chair, is the is the status of shovel ready still amber, though? Correct. Okay, so um, and just by way of background, um, I, I know we've got several new um, members of the committee around the table. Um, so Shovel Ready is a work program that's been underway since uh, late 2020. Um, it is a work program that came about from um, following uh, COVID recovery and the government making funding available to regional council on a number of fronts. Um, we had our climate resilience funding, which comes in through MB uh, uh, and Carnoa. Um, we also have funding from MFE. Um, for several projects in relation to environmental restoration um, and of, also from Te Urudako, um, again, for the, um, in the environmental restoration space, um, with those MB projects very much focused on infrastructure. Uh, the program itself uh, is in the order of 48 million um, across all funders. Um, of that, there is approximately 29 million um, of funding from government across those um, various providers. Um, plus there's approximately 5 million, 4.9 million from other um, funding sources, um, such as Waikato River Authority, um, that help to support the overall program. Um, so we are well underway with the program. Um, it's about halfway through. It's been described as, as, as sort of the halfway point um, for us, um, and we have achieved a significant amount in that time. Uh, Council has had to uh, scale up its own resourcing in terms of managing the program. Um, so we have uh, duly leading a team of, um, of uh, managers that are, are looking after each of those different areas um, to ensure that we have the visibility and tracking in place um, that's expected of us from government. Um, there is quite significant reporting requirements placed on council um, in terms of receiving the funding in the order of we, we need to provide monthly reports and also quarterly updates um, to government um, in terms of the progress that we're making against our plans. So turning to the February um, 2023 report, um, and as you may guess, uh, the um, the sort of non-start of a summer has been a, a particular feature for the program and has slowed um, a couple of projects, um, and particularly because um, it does mean that a number of our staff are deployed into response uh, um, response roles um, to order we to ensure that we manage that particular um, role that we have of council. Um, as I said before, the program overall is amber. Um, and that is particularly due to the budget and time pressures um, that we have around uh, uh, two particular projects. Um, one is the asset rationalisation um, project, which is underway at the moment, um, and we are currently working through um, a plan to conclude that project um, in the next year. Um, the other project is the replacement vessel, which was the subject of a council decision um, earlier this year. Um, and we are currently working through um, due diligence for council um, in terms of contract negotiations to progress a major milestone of that con of that project, which is the construction itself of the vessel. Um, looking at key achievements over the um, over the last uh, period of reporting, uh, so readiness of sites. We had to have several um, uh, infrastructure work sites that were underway when the weather came through, um, so we did have to ensure that they were prepared to uh, receive that weather. Um, most, um, for those that are unaware, we do do most of our infrastructure work over the summer period um, when uh, weather conditions usually permit. Um, obviously, we've had to uh, make some adjustments this period. Um, and and also, achievement in terms of we are making progress on our um, contract negotiations um, in, regard to in, in regard to the replacement vessel um, and also working very closely with our funder, MB, in that front um, so that they are aware of where we're at and making adjustments where necessary. Uh, looking ahead, um, and this is, I guess, touched on earlier, that we do need to look at the impact of Cyclone Gabriel on our programs. Um, and it's not just Cyclone Gabriel. In fact, we had hail. Um, we had the Auckland anniversary event. Um, and in fact, as I said earlier, 
um, Coromandel has been in flood mode since uh, before Christmas. So we do need to assess the impact of the work program and what that looks like going forward um, with the aim to have a, a, a much more certain picture in time for the quarter three forecast um, to council. Um, we have we are also looking at some additional um, funding um, at the moment from the Lotteries Board for the asset rationalisation project. Um, and that is to support particularly the environmental restoration, uh, environmental enhancement aspect of that project, which involves a tidal, um, tidal area which floods for bird roosting. Uh, I have touched on, um, I guess, a couple of key projects. Um, I would note the Roger Harris pump station is one that's currently underway, um, which is an inlet upgrade project. Um, it was significantly impacted by the flooding and that site did need to be closed down while we had um, significantly high river levels. Um, but we are working to conclude that project at the moment, so I expect to see that concluded um, this season, which will be another good one to close off. Um, and I also just uh, highlighted here the Church Lease pump station. Um, so that's the second of our fish friendly pumps, um, which in, involves enclosed Archimedes screw pumps. Um, we're currently um, progressing discussions with uh, direct beneficiaries around the best option forward um, with the aim to be constructing in the 23 24 construction season. Um, so I expect to receive an update from us um, on all of those key projects um, in due course. Uh, the report itself highlights the key program risks and issues. Um, I do note that um, unsurprisingly, we do have supply chain issues um, coming through um, with in terms of um, both uh, domestic and international. Um, so we're uh, making sure that we're aware of those and managing them appropriately and making the correct uh, project and program decisions to respond to those. Um, and also obviously the impact of weather events um, on these projects. Uh, Mr Chairman, I'll have to leave it there. Um, and as I said, I am very conscious that you haven't um, seen the exact report, so I will get that to members as soon as possible and happy to receive queries after the meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> um, we are due a break. In fact, we're overdue a break. I would like to take questions on the um, shovel ready part of the meeting and then take our break. Uh, so are there any questions? Yeah, thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, Greg, would you mind just diving back down into that vessel a little bit further with me, just where we are in that process? This is a project that I can see, I have concerns is a risk for the council. Um, and yeah, so if you could just a little bit more of an update of where we're sitting in that process, and I guess also just a reminder of what that time frame is for that shovel ready funding. Thank you. Sure. Um, so. We are in a procurement process at the moment, um, so Council made a decision to provide some additional funding um, before Christmas, um, and that allowed us to enter into that uh, procurement process for the construction of the vessel. Um, the, um, the, the contract or the permit, uh, approval, I suppose, was provided by the Tenders Board to proceed, um, but it was subject to a number of um, requirements in terms of due diligence um, to make sure that we are looking after the interests of both Council and also our external funder. Um, we are in the process of running through that um, in terms of contract negotiations. Um, there would be not much more I would be able to share um, um, because of the commercial sensitivity really, of yeah. those. Um, but suffice to say that we are working towards um, a conclusion of that process um, within the next uh, couple of months. Um, yeah. We are also working with, so you mentioned our external funder. Um, so we are also working with MB in terms of any variations that will be required to the funding agreement, um, particularly around time. Um, just to make sure that we can accommodate um, the, the shift that we've had. Yeah. Um, thanks for that, uh, Greg. Just you mentioned that the amber status was due to the budget and the time pressure on the asset res rationalization and the replacement vessel. So if you took those two out, would the status be green? Uh, I would. Um, the, the other project that's probably not mentioned there is Churchill East, which I did touch on. Okay. Um, I'll, say, I'll say that also um, just needs, that's because it's currently under discussion at the moment, um, I would say that was one to trigger a monitor. Um, I would actually just ask whether Julie has any other insights into um, any particular drivers for our AMBER status. Uh, thanks, Greg. Um, kia ora. The other one that we're just um, monitoring, and it looks like it will be back on track, is um, Piakal Green Corridor. Uh, that one is mainly um, due to time, though, rather than budget. Um, and that should be back on track in the next month, the next reporting period or two. Thanks. Thank you. 
If there are no more questions, oh, Chris. Uh, look, uh, Julie, just for clarity, I think the question was asked that if if those, uh, would it be green were it not for the asset rationalisation project and the vessel? Um, I think Greg's indicated, well, there's a couple of minor issues around the others. Would it be green or would it be amber? I just think that was just to get some clarity on the answer. It would still, it would still be, um, it would still be, it'd be, well, it'd be a discretionary decision probably because as Greg noted, the um, Churchill East has some bu budget pressure. And so what, we, what we're doing is where we have that unresolved budget pressure and it turns a project red, um, we're putting the program at red. That's under the current guidance. Um, it, it just means that it's highlighting that um, there is that unresolved issue. So where we have a where we have a plan in place, um, a project would be amber, and um, and so you know it may not turn the program back to green as such. It might go to an intermediary stage of of amber where we're working on a plan. Does that clarify? I look forward to getting the February report with, with greater <laughs> detail. Thank you for that, Julie. Yes, thank you. If there are no further questions, can we take a 10 minute break and be back here to look at um, Project Reboot in um, 10 minutes time? Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you, Julie.